the Dinorwick quarry reached its peak of production in the 1870s, during the boom years of the Victorian age. It was slate that kept the rain out of the Industrial Revolution. The Victorians couldn't get enough of it. In its heyday, the quarry employed three and a half thousand men, and Wales produced over four-fifths of all British roofing slates at the rate of about 485,000 tonnes a year. closed abruptly in 1969. Only three weeks after Prince Charles had knelt on a piece of Dinorwick slate during his investiture at Carnarvon. No warning had been given of the closure which left 300 men out of work. At that moment, the quarry stood a good chance of collapsing forever into its own rubble. And indeed, it would have been lost if not for the efforts of one man, former chief engineer Hugh Richard Jones. One of the first people to came in were the scrap people. They were going to scrap everything. And that's uh, what the receiver wanted, really. He wanted the money for the firm after the cut broke. So I had to stop them scrapping the place. And uh, I went on the media, the press and all that, you know, interviewed. Two people from the National Museum of Wales came. And they couldn't believe their eyes, like, you know, so many things in here then. So they said, uh, yes, sure, make it a bit shame, and carried on from there. Since the first visitors arrived in 1973, it's become one of the most popular of the National Museum centres, and it's lost none of its atmosphere. The first time I came here, I was 11 years old. The quarry only had a few more weeks of life left in it. We didn't know that at the time. And it was an absolute time capsule for a, a budding industrial archaeologist. It was, it was heaven on earth. The next time I came back here was a couple of years later. It was exactly the same, except they put a turnstile on it. In North Wales, at Dinorick Quarry, injury was a daily occurrence. The owners even built a special hospital where injured employees enjoyed the benefit of the skills developed in the engineering workshops. If you lost an arm or a leg, the craftsman could easily knock one up for you. Dr. Mills Roberts used to order his uh, stuff from the hospital and he used to make a little drawing of it and uh, send it down to the maintenance yard. He made one contraption, the, the man had his uh, arms and legs amputated and uh, so he wanted a contraption that this man could use a knife and fork and also take his hat off in going to chapel. And he made a drawing, a sketch out of what he wanted brought it down to Thomas Hughes, the blacksmith in the maintenance yard, and he made this gadget for this chap, and he lived for a long time using this kind of gadget. The less fortunate were removed to the mortuary and laid out, of course, on a piece of slate. The commonest occupational hazard, a nasty one to look at, was the thumb injury. The other dangers from this, of course, working with, with slate, was the inhalation of dust, silicosis on the lungs. And quite a number of slate workers did get that mainly from inside the sheds where they were splitting, not so much from the rock face, because obviously they were out in the open air and the wind would obviously drive it away. In the 1890s, a Dr Mills Roberts reported the Dinoric quarrymen work in a healthy, bracing atmosphere. Many doctors believed that silicosis was caused not by inhaling slate dust, but by drinking too much tea. Roberts noted disapprovingly that the men's four meals a day consisted precisely of bread, butter, and that appalling toxin, strong tea. And we got only one of these. 
It's true that the kettle was always boiling at the caban, or cabin, where the men took their breaks. There's absolutely no doubt at all that in very many quarries and among very many groups of quarrymen, it was an absolutely vital force where they discussed religion, where they discussed politics. It's true that they were a remarkably well-informed group of men. It would have been looked after by um, a sort of supervisor who um, decided where the younger boys who came in to work here would have sat, uh, looked after them, made sure that behaviour here was appropriate. And no swearing at all, you know. No. If you're swearing in the cabin, you have to be quiet. Yeah. yeah. The person next to you would clip you around the ear yeah. yeah. You know, it didn't matter who you were. I sell according to the conditions of sale which are printed in your catalogue and they are displayed here in front for your attention. They are standard conditions and provide for the clearance of all lots by Friday the 9th of January 1970. Before I say anything further, can everybody hear me clearly please? If you cannot, will you put your hand up? Well, uh, suppose if I'd, if I'd asked you six months ago that this quarry would be going into the hammer, what would you say? I know. Uh, but, um, the boat, no. Would anybody else? No, I wouldn't believe you. No, I no, no. Really. What about the old people? I wonder what they'd say if they, if they knew what we got the experience of seeing tomorrow on Saturday. Well, the working of this quarry was going to be here forever. Yeah, well, I, I, I remember when I started yeah. working here, my mother said, there's nowhere to beat the quarry, it's as good as the bank of England. Within about ten minutes of your last purchase, your bill will be ready. I'm one of these people that thinks everything should pay. I think a business has to be a going concern or it's just not worthwhile. The day of the auction has come, and I don't know what are you feeling today, after spending the best part of our lives in this quarry, and going back uh, for 40 years, and remembering about this quarry, going full swing, about 3,000 men working here, and hanging like spiders on these rocks. And uh, I don't know, what are your feelings about it today? Well, my, my, my experience of today is I'm very, very down at the bottom. I'm very, very upset of seeing the quarry uh, going into the armor. Uh, to think that I've been coming here for 46 years, day in, day out, and uh, when you come to the age of over 16, uh, something seems to happen to that industry. Well, you, you've given your best part of your life in the, in, in, to the quarry. Where can I go and find it? Welcome to uh, the Quarry Hospital, Mr. William Hughes uh, is going to talk today about the time that he uh, lived here and also his family's experience of, of, of living here in Trunachy uh, and Chris O'Connor's here, Mr. Hughes. Thank you. Yes, I um, actually lived here uh, from when I was born in 1939 and uh, my mother was still here until 1967. Uh, my father joined the hospital staff in 1904, uh, and he came in with no qualifications at all. And he learned from the bottom up, primarily under the auspices of a man called Dr. Milt Roberts. And he was the resident surgeon here. And a lot of the things that my father learned was obviously from uh, Mills Roberts. And as time went on, he was given more and more responsibility. And from starting off just changing dressings, 
bit by bit, he was able to do much more complicated things. Then there was a period during the First World War when things didn't really happen in the quarry. And uh, he um, cheated by his age, because he was 36 then. 